John chapter 11. Jesus said, and you can read it with me if you like, I am, verse 25, John 11. Jesus said to her what? I am. Wonderful expression, title that comes from God given to Moses from the burning bush. Whom shall I say sent me? Who's going with me? Who shall I declare to the people? And God said what? He said, I am. I am that I am. That's me. And Jesus picks up that name. We've seen him use it before. He does so here again. I am right here, right now, what you need. It's not what I can give to you or do for you. It's the gift of myself. That's what I give to you. I am whatever you need right now. Not just promises that apply to a distant future. Someday, we say as Christians, we'll go to heaven and yay, won't that be great. But right here, right now, the Lord says to Martha, and he says to you and me, I am. What do you need? What can I do for you? Who can I be for you? Is really the key, isn't it? I am. Do you believe this? That's what changes church, right? That's what makes this more than just a song and dance and a routine and a performance. It's that we get to come and we get to sit at the feet of Almighty God who says to us, I am. Amazing, isn't it? Incredible love and amazing grace. Do you believe this? That changes church for you, doesn't it? When we understand that it's the gift of himself that God wants to give us and not just do something for us. Amen? Well, we're in the middle of this story, this powerful chapter. Mary and Martha had a brother, Lazarus. You can glance back over it with me. He got sick. They sent word to Jesus, but he didn't come, and Lazarus died. And when Jesus finally came, Martha runs up to him and says those words. We talked about it last time. You remember verse 21, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. We relate to the emotional expression, right? Probably not a rebuke, but just remorse talking here. Lord, if you had only been here, this wouldn't have happened. Where were you and what's going on and all the things that are kind of emotionally charged within those words. Jesus looks at her and says to her, your brother will, what? Rise again. And she says, what? If you were here last week, I know. I, I know, Lord, right? I know, I, I've read that Bible verse. I heard it in Sunday school. Someday we'll all go to heaven when we die, yay. And yet Jesus had so much more that he wanted to share with her, to show to her. And so he addresses her again. He clarifies and amplifies. Verse 25, he says, I am. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection. I'm the author, the inventor of resurrection. That is life when there's been death. I invented that. Jesus is expressing to her here. And that's huge. God didn't invent death, as it were. He didn't enslave our race to sin and to death, but he did something about it. I'm becoming the answer. I am the solution for you. I am the resurrection, Jesus says here. Wow. How important to her current situation. Amen. I am the resurrection. I'm the source of life. I don't have life, but I am life. Again, not the gift, but the giver. That's the whole point of this passage. This is who I am to you, for you. He who believes in me, Jesus said, though he may die, he shall live, and whoever lives and believes in me shall what? You, you have a Bible. Good morning. Though he may die, he shall live, and whoever lives and believes in me, what? Shall never die. Do you, do you actually believe this? Are we just here, you know, part of the club? Belief is essential. Belief is the key 
to everything we see in this passage? Do you look at me? And when you look at me, do you believe in me? Do you see me? She said to him, and we closed here last time, right? Fantastic, firm words of faith. This is the foothold of faith theologically that that teachers will talk about, from which she could move forward. She could place her foot on this hold and step forward from here into all that we are blessed to read about and see. Yes, Lord, I don't understand, we said last time, and few of us do. Some of us think we do, and that's a real problem, isn't it? That's a Bible joke. That's a church joke. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Savior, the Messiah, the Son of God who is to come into the world. I believe. I don't understand, but I know who you are. I've seen enough. I've heard enough. I believe in you. That's it, isn't it? We continue on, verse 28, wherein we have so much to learn about life and death and who, just who this Jesus is. The the real deal, the realities of life are addressed in this chapter, aren't they? So verse 28, let's continue. And when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary. So Martha has this encounter with Jesus and, and like a fantastic, a sweet sister, she goes and grabs Mary so she can have a face-to-face with Jesus. That's what a a good sister does, you know what I'm saying? Like I, I heard from the Lord, I met with the Lord, now now you two come and hear from the Lord, receive from the Lord. Take what we talk about on a Sunday morning, what you hear in your devotions each and every single day, and tap someone on the shoulder and say, this is what Jesus said to me, what does he want to say to you? Simply pass it on. So she called Mary secretly, saying, the teacher has come. The way, the truth, and the life is here, and is calling for you. As we kind of set up the scene last time, uh, the house is filled with with mourners and grievers, professional and, you know, lay people. But those grievers who would come, the Jewish religious leaders who were here, not because they really were affected emotionally, but because this was an opportunity for them to lay their own belief, theology, so on and so forth upon these people. You had those who I'm sure meant well, and so they wailed, Uh, loudly and grieved dramatically because that was a part of the culture at this time. And I'm sure you had those there that sincerely were expressing their grief. Mary's in the midst of it all, so quietly she sneaks away from the whole production, the show, to meet with Jesus. As soon as she heard that Jesus wanted to meet with her, she arose quickly and came to him. That's what Mary always does as we observe her in the Scripture. Amen? Amen. Verse 30, now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. In the midst of everyone who was there, not the kind of connection Jesus wanted to have with her, but a private, a personal meeting to exchange some some heartfelt information, some truth to pass on his person to her. But of course, the Jews followed verse 31. They'll be on the uh, heels of Mary. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, she's going to the tomb to weep there. So Mary comes, verse 32, and let's take note of this. Mary came where Jesus was. She saw him and just seems to do what Mary always did. If you're a student of the scripture, if you're familiar with this gospel character, she just falls down at his feet, right? falls down at his feet where Mary always was. And we've discussed this. We've learned a little bit about Martha. We've appreciated her. And I hope you appreciate the Marthas in your life. But again, we come back to the marvelous example of Mary. We see the method of Mary, and you can write that down. The ministry of Mary, if you like that. The mind of Mary. Either way, take note of what this lady always does. Whether she's up We read about that in Luke chapter 10, a a time of delight and afterglow. The Lord's kicking it with his disciples. Mary, Martha, Lazarus are there. They're teaching and fellowshipping and eating, and it's great. And there Mary is at the feet of Jesus, worshiping, listening, receiving from him. That proverbial place where we Christians are called, where we have opportunity to live, right? Just at the feet of Jesus. 
And whether you're here in the sanctuary or off in the community, if you're at your workplace, whatever the case may be, we can continue in that inner personal posture, just at the feet of Jesus, listening to him, receiving from him, fellowshipping with him. Isn't it great that God goes wherever you are? That's glorious. We still don't understand it at times, that David can sing and say, even if I make my bed in the depths of Sheol, of hell you're there, where can I go from your spirit? Right? Theologically, we have a hard time explaining that. But again, as we see the characters in the Scripture, the places where Paul went, the depths of despair, places that seemed a whole lot like hell, we kind of get it. God goes with us wherever we go for Him in that wonderful way that He does. And so, this posture, this place of just sitting at the feet of Jesus, it's where we need to remain as Christians, camp out, as it were, If she's experiencing delight, Mary's at the feet of Jesus. Here, where there's nothing but darkness and despair, she falls down at the feet of Jesus. A great example for us to take note of and followed, and we kind of closed on that last time. Most are immature and unbalanced in this area of waiting on the Lord and sitting at the feet of Jesus. And that's okay to say. Immaturity, it exists. Uh, Being unbalanced, it's there. Let's call it what it is, recognize it for what it is, and be better, right? We see this so simply in when it feels good, when I'm filled with delight. I go to church and I seek the Lord. Yay! It feels good, it's fun. I feel like it. But when times are tough and darkness and despair comes. I don't seek the Lord. Why would I? I'm not getting the things I want from God. I'm not feeling like it at this present time. And so I'm not going to church. I'm not cracking open the Word of God. I'm not going to sing words of praise. Why? Because I'm not feeling the blessing, right? And so, too, you've got those who, who work the other way. They run to the Lord. They sit at the feet of Jesus. They seek God. They wait on Him when times are difficult. I share with the first service, ministering through, it just hit me in that first service, 9-11. That was the most incredible, extraordinary time of ministry because we had prayer meetings every day, and guess what? People actually came. Every day, starting that day. In fact, we were in a prayer meeting when it occurred, and so we just, man, Morning, noon, and night, we had prayer meetings at the church, and people came. And I don't know if you know how extraordinary that is, but it's extraordinary that people come to a prayer meeting in these last days. Amen? And so it was the difficulty, it was the darkness, it was the despair, and some, that's how they work. I need the Lord. I see it clearly now. Something's wrong, and so I'm going to run to God. So they run to the church. They run to the Lord. When times are difficult, my marriage is in trouble, my kids are out to lunch, I lost my job, what do I do? I'm going to run to the Lord. And that's good. That's great. God works through that. But again, the immaturity, the the unbalancedness is when things get good again and we, well, I don't need Him anymore. We do that too. And so however way you work, let's pray and work toward maturity because it's the mature Mary As it were, it's always going to be sitting at the feet of Jesus. If times are good and I'm filled with delight or despair and darkness and death, where else am I going to go? I don't understand, but I know who you are, right? We run to the Lord and we stay there. We camp out in that wonderful way as Israel did around the tabernacle, tents facing toward it, as it were. Amen? Be like Mary, the method of Mary, the maturity of Mary. Anything less is just immaturity. It's unbalanced. It's not good, and we should grow up a little bit. Amen? Move past that place where where we think that Christianity, it's about getting what you want from God. That is represented, that's taught, that's exemplified in many of the sermons and books and movies and studies that we'll hear, that we'll see, that we'll read. That's the idea that's presented. Come to the Lord and He'll just give you whatever you want. 
Take away all your, it's going to be great, just come to the Lord. That's not real life, that's not how this works. Christianity, as we said last Sunday, is not getting something from God. We get a lot of stuff from God, that's cool. But we get the gift of God himself. That's what this is. Emmanuel, God with us, we get God and he gets us. That's what this is. It's a relationship that transcends anything physical. And whether we have or we do not have, it doesn't matter because we have him. I am my beloved's, and he is mine. That's what this is. That's what we get with God through Jesus Christ. That's how this faith works. And there is nothing more important or more valuable than that. That the Lord would want me. Go ahead. It's like three people. It's okay. We have a lot to learn from each other. I love that in the body of Christ. I love that. And some people, oh, if they clap during the message, you can't do that. Yes, you can And then other people, it's weird not to clap. And so we balance each other out. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. A lot to learn from each other and appreciate about each other. Because that's worth applauding. There's such confusion in regard to that razor-sharp point, and at least it should be that these days. Not getting something from God, but the gift of God himself. That's what he's given. That's what what he's done. And how glorious that is. Amen? Oh, we're saved with benefits. That's what David said in the Psalms. And that's true. But how clearer those benefits become when it's the God that we love, whose feet we simply sit at. That's where it's at. That's where contentment comes from. It flows from Him. And we'll go on to see that as we work our way through this chapter a little more clearly. So Mary comes, amen? Shift around, refocus, here we go. She comes, she falls at his feet, and here's what's interesting. If you've been with us, we read it at the beginning of our study, but here, word for word, Mary says what Martha said a moment ago. Now, Mary wasn't there. Mary didn't know that Martha had said this, but Jesus was, and so he hears it twice. And this is kind of interesting. Put on your little, you know, hat and spectacles and get out your magnifying glass, because we're going to investigate here for just a minute, but she says the same thing Martha did word for word. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. That's a lie. We investigated this statement and how foolish it is last week, so you can listen to that message if you weren't with us. We say the same things. We're tempted with the same whispers that are seen and heard here. God isn't there. God doesn't care. Why did the Lord allow? Why didn't he show up? And why didn't he heal? And all those things. We talked about that last time. What intrigues me this week is that she repeats it verbatim, word for word. Where did this sentence start? Uh, Satan, the father of lies, the devil, He who deceives and corrupts and captures people's hearts and minds with such statements, it's possible. Was it one of the religious leaders, the cynics? Was it a family member? Was it Mary? Was it it Martha? At the end of the day, it doesn't matter. The fact that both of them repeat it, that's a real problem, isn't it? They heard it, listen, they heard it, they began to believe it, and then they began to what? Share it, speak it, preach it. That's a real problem. We had some fun in the first service. Everybody still knows the song, I think. Be careful, little ears. What you hear? Yeah, you, you remember? How many? Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Go ahead. This is the audience participation part. Be careful, little feet, where you walk. How many of us remember that song? Raise your hand, just so I know. See, those things in children's ministry in Sunday school, they stick, right? So keep, keep them around and keep speaking and sharing and practicing because it brings us back to a simple place where we can consider biblical truth as it's practical to our lives because that's really, really important, isn't it? We think so much of ourselves. I'm strong. I'm spiritually mature. I can listen to that line or read that magazine or watch that program or hang out with this person who does nothing but bag on 
Jesus and Christians in the church. I can be around all these places and people and hear and read and see all these things and it just doesn't affect me. It feels good to say that because we're prideful. We're arrogant and we think we're more strong than we actually are and that's a problem. The Lord counsels us. Man, he says, be careful what you see with those eyes. Be careful what you worship because we become like what we worship. That's why idolatry is so dangerous. The people that we listen to, the programs that we watch, the music that we hear, it always has an effect. And it bounces around in our brains until it begins to change the way we think and then who we are and how we behave. We've got to be careful. Be being filled with the Spirit. If you sow to the flesh, you will reap death and destruction. You sow to the Spirit, you will reap life. You won't regret it. So be careful what you pour into your mind. Make a part of your life. Assimilate. Be careful. And even the people that we hang out with, I have a ministry to them, we might say. Fantastic. Somebody needs to, right? But be careful, be wise, be discerning, because we are infected quite quickly by the things that surround us. God help us to be washing ourselves often with the Word of God, the truth, so we can see clearly, minister to others correctly and effectively. Amen? So she's infected by this statement wherever it came from, Verse 33, she says that same thing to the Lord. It's just not true. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, it didn't matter that she said this to the Lord. It didn't prevent or, or, or stop short his ministry to her. And I love that. As a leader, it's difficult. As a servant, it's hard when you're mistreated and abused. When people say things like this to you. Amen? If you've been there. How does Jesus respond? In love and faithful service. It's as if he's not affected at all by it. You failed me, Jesus! And he just keeps on doing what he does. We should take note of that here. It's what love is. It's how it works. And it's what a leader does. Jesus now, here we go, words that we've been waiting for. Uh, verses and truths that should make us feel very small as Christians and pastors and teachers because this is Almighty God doing something here. And thus we should tread lightly. It's holy ground. We should be careful to study carefully. Rightly dividing the word of truth as we observe something so weighty and so powerful, the character demonstrated of Almighty God. So the scene we've, we've put together, right? Mary comes, she's weeping, she falls at his feet, she expresses this grief, remorse. When Jesus saw her weeping, underline that, when he heard the crowd of mourners and wailers coming, he groaned in the spirit, underline, highlight, write down these words, they're important. He groaned in the spirit and was troubled Number one, he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And verse 35, two words, shortest verse in the Bible, speaks volumes though, doesn't it? It packs within it both the, the humanity of Jesus Christ and yet his deity. And both are seen so clearly. Jesus, what? He wept when he saw, when he heard, when he felt Jesus groaned in the spirit and was troubled firstly, and he wept secondly. Where have you laid him? Come and see. Jesus wept. That word for wept in the original language in the Greek, these things are important, doesn't speak of the, you know, the, the routine, the performance, the wailing uh, that was, you know, performed, done by many of the other Grievers who were there, it speaks of a quiet weeping, a true and genuine expression of grief. God can cry, and that's what we read right here. 
And what gets me about this grief is that he knew where he was headed. He already declared, this death will not end in death, right? It'll work out for the glory of God. The sickness is not unto death. And we clearly see what the plan was, and yet Jesus in his humanity, because he loves, because he cares, he has compassion on your condition. And that's huge. It's just what the scripture says, especially in the book of Hebrews, and yet when we see it right here, he knows what he's going to do, and yet he still weeps and grieves, quietly just shedding tears. He knows all things, and yet he experiences this great grief. It's called compassion. He loves and cares for us. The Greek gods at this time, and many are familiar with them, what, what dominated the globe for the most part at this time, the, the world-dominating viewpoint was that, yes, there are gods, but they don't care about you. They don't give you another thought. They kind of live off of you, right? They're indifferent to you. They could, could not care less about you. They're certainly not going to intervene to help you. They kind of take delight in your misfortunes and your difficulties, your problems, your pain. That's the image that the world culturally, that society had painted uh, this picture of, of God, or the gods, as it were. But that is not who God is, and that's not how he feels about you and me, how he responds to our pain, our problems. He has compassion because he cares. Jesus came exemplifying that reality, God in human form, fully God, fully man. So he weeps here. And that should just speak volumes to you as to the ministry uh, that our Lord has for you, his desire to meet with you in your moment of grief and trouble and to minister to you. We see additionally here that Jesus groaned in the Spirit and was troubled. It's on the screen so we might understand this more fully. Let's define it accurately. The use of this word, it's not a word used very often in the Greek language or in the Scriptures, but it's actually this groaning which is used twice verse 33 and verse 38, is used of a horse snorting, typically when it's used of a man, of a person, it speaks of a, an anger, a stirring within, a call to action. Something about this incenses me. This is wrong and I'm going to act in response to it. Again, a beautiful combination, both the compassion, the grief that Jesus had to the point of tears, and yet being challenged to, angry about what he sees, and it's a call to action. He makes a response. William Barclay said, here it must mean that such deep emotion sees Jesus that an involuntary groan was wrung from his heart being confronted by the grief and the whole scene, moved with compassion and yet motivated to action. I appreciate that very much here. John Calvin said this, it's on the screen. Christ does not come to the sepulcher as an idle spectator, but like a wrestler preparing for the contest. Therefore, no wonder that he groans twice here, for the violent tyranny of death which he had to overcome stands before his eyes. This is who I am and why I'm here, what I've come to do, and it's fix this problem. This is wrong, and that is death. This breaks my heart and motivates me to act because death is upside down. Death is not something that God created or ushered into our race. We did that. And yet it's exactly why Jesus had come, to reveal all of this and to demonstrate his power over death. I'm the solution to this problem. I'm the resurrection and the life. A lot here that's just beautiful to consider. Amen? We ask so many questions, especially about death, but again, the difficulties of life and so on and so forth. To see that our Lord cares, that's so important. Never question it. Defend this truth. Come to this passage and read it and share it. God cares about our condition. Whose fault is it? Mine and yours. It's ours. And yet he cares 
and he's working toward the solution. We want an immediate solution to the current problem. Nothing really wrong with that, but it's not always going to come. God has done something so far greater than to fix one tiny little problem that one person experiences, though he cares, and oftentimes he does work. He has solved the death dilemma, being that whoever would place their faith, their hope, their trust in him will never experience, never taste of eternal death. And though physical death, as he says very honestly here, may come, don't fear. The Lord sees he cares, and he has acted on our behalf, and he's about to act to demonstrate his power over death for all to see and hear and for us to read about and be blessed by this morning. So much more could be said. And I appreciate it so much. Where have you laid him? Verse 34. Come and see. Jesus wept. Then, verse 36, the Jews said, see how he loved him. As he wept, as tears came down. See how he loved him. I think there's some personal connectivity that we can have to that precious verse. Verse 37, and some of them said, of course, these Jews were also here. We've discussed them previously. Could not this man, here the cynical statement comes, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind Remember what Jesus did in chapter 10 just recently? Opened the eyes of a man born blind and they were so upset about that. So they bring it up again here. Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from what? From dying. Of course he could. Of course he could, but he didn't, right? And God does not always do that, and you know this. And it's why we got to keep the focus of this chapter, man, set right before us. It's not, well, sure, things may be hard, but then that loved one will be raised from the dead. No, good people die. And that's difficult and it's hard to know that the Lord cares and that he's provided the absolute answer for death and despair. That's the importance of this passage. Not to impart the idea that resurrection will always come in this life or healing will always take place of whatever may ail us, and we've talked about this. God does not always heal. God does not always raise the dead. But inevitably, without question, ultimately, this gift, this promise will always come. Amen? Of course he could have kept him from dying, but this is working toward a greater weight of glory, and that's what your lives are working toward as a child of God. Something is more important than your soul. Your soul is saved. How about the soul of those who do not know the Lord around you? It makes suffering acceptable. It makes suffering okay. We've talked about putting down immaturity. Let's pick up maturity, and that's what a mature, an adult Christian can say. Yeah, it's difficult to suffer or experience hardship or loss, but if God is glorified through that circumstance, and others see the Lord and believe in him, and they're spared in eternal hell and can enjoy heaven with me and you and all the rest of us, well, then that is worth it. That's okay. And so, Lord, I don't look for it, and I don't really want it, but if suffering is necessary, bring it into my life. I'm okay with it. I will respond in the way that Job did. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Why? Because others are seeing Jesus, and there's nothing more important than that. That's called selfless love, isn't it? That's demonstrated by Jesus Christ, isn't it? It's who he is. It's what he's done for you and for me. And we have the opportunity to do the same. So God help us, as many as are mature, to, to pick up and put on this mind, the mind of Christ. Amen? Verse 38. Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Here comes Martha. God bless her. Takes a good step forward and a couple steps back. We love her. Like Peter, I relate to them a lot. And she's kind of saying, no, Lord, again. Uh, I don't think so, Lord. Take away the stone, Jesus said. Of course, he could have done it himself, but he's giving these guys opportunity to demonstrate their faith, to take a step, to say, Jesus, I trust you. I will obey you. 
It's one thing to say it, but it's another thing to do it, right? Roll away the stone. Okay, Lord, this is weird. Okay, it's going to stink. All right, but I'm going to do that. I'm going to respond in faith. I'm going to take a step into the river before it parts. Old Testament, right? Same principle. Do you really trust the Lord? It's easy to say in the sanctuary. But God is working to build your faith, so obey him first. Before you question, before you doubt, do what he tells you to do, and then you'll see. And that's exactly what Jesus encourages her to do. It's what faith is all about. Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, what? Lord, uh, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. King James, love it. He stinketh. Right? That's the reality of it. He's dead. He's rotten. This is not good. It would be inappropriate or improper. Right? We, we just get all of that physically with what the Lord is asking her to do. She kind of says no. And then Jesus charges her, reminds her as a good teacher, did I not say to you, come on, Martha, here we go. It's what this is all about, faith, right? Looking at me, believing in me, trusting in me. And we're building this thing. Jesus isn't offended, per se, by her refusal, lack of understanding. He's coaching her and teaching her and challenging her, reminding her that this is what life is all about following, obeying the Lord by faith, and seeing the glory of God and saying, wow. It's real. It's there. And it all came as a result of me simply obeying and trusting the Lord, placing my own lack of understanding aside and obeying the Lord. Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Who wants to see the glory of God? I do. Man, that's fantastic. I think we all would say yes to that as Christians. Here's the key, folks. Whatever he says to you, do it. Just obey the Lord. Stick your nose in the scripture. Be led by the Spirit. Sit at the feet of Jesus. Whatever he says to you, do it. You will see the glory of God. And we'll all get uh, uh, different glimpses from time to time of it. But that's what this life is all about. And that's what Jesus says to her here. Some think that faith is somehow mustering like the force. <clears throat> Enough faith to do a great miracle and see the work of God. That is not what's being said here. The glory of God is going to come one way or another. You just will see it or you won't. When you say, yes, Lord, and you obey, then you're going to see it, and you're going to say, wow, the glory of God. And others will be like, I don't see it. That's just natural circumstances or coincidence or everybody's got an explanation, right? But you will see clearly the glory of God because God has brought you along for the ride. And if you will, try to keep stuff simple, it's the ride that God is concerned with. And it's a roller coaster sometimes, but that's what this life is about. You learning to see him more clearly through all the twists and turns and the highs and lows. You're not going anywhere. You're not jumping ship. You're just trusting that he's got you. And you will see the glory of God. It's not summoning somehow on our own, with our own strength, the faith to say to this mountain, be removed. That's not what this is. Trust me, believe me, obey me, and you will see. If you don't, you won't. So, Wisely, Martha tells the boys, and they roll away the stone, right? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. I like that. And Jesus lifted up his eyes, and he prayed out loud. Jesus rarely did this. Typically, he sneaks away, and he prays in private with the Lord. But we have a few prayers of the Lord that are written down, and this is just a short, sweet, like, offering of thanksgiving, because God, it seems, and Jesus had already talked, right? Father, I thank you that you've heard me, and I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Kind of like the intimacy that that speaks of here, but for mostly just the thanksgiving, 
that Jesus offers vocally, publicly here. This is for them. You and me, we're good, but this is for them. And that's truly what it was all about. Verse 43, here we go. Now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice. Here's where the anger, the action comes to make right what was wrong. He cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, what? Come forth. Say it with your biggest King James kind of voice. Lazarus, come forth. If, if, if he didn't say Lazarus, everyone would come out. That's a good joke. I love that Bible joke. So he says Lazarus specifically, because that's all for now. Not everybody, just him. That God may be glorified that all might believe in Jesus and see that he is the resurrection and the life. It's important stuff. Lazarus, come forth, and he who had died, he who had died, right? He who had died four day dead, you remember we talked about that, beyond all hope of coming back, resuscitation, he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said again to those who were standing by, all those who had hands and feet and could go and do, you know, the work of the Lord. Jesus calls them out. Jesus resurrects them from the dead. And then it's your job, it's my job to tend to them, to take care of them, to help clean them up and get their life right. It's his power, but then we've got a responsibility as mature Christians, adults, to take care of the babes in Christ, right? That's important. Loose him and let him go. Help him out. He's hopping, you know, out in his grave clothes and he can't see and he's wondering what in the world's going on. He was in heaven for four days. I mean, give me a break and now he's back. What's going on? He's bewildered, right? It's kind of sad. Yet it's for the glory of God. And so loosed him and let him go. Then many of the Jews, just like Jesus said, right? Many of the Jews who had come to Mary and seen the things Jesus did, what'd they do? Believed in him, just like God said. If that not is a great, uh, uh, if that's not a great conclusion to the story, just like Jesus said. I know this is going to be hard. I know it's going to be dark and tough. There's going to be tears. It's going to be difficult. And yet in the end, this is what's going to cause people to believe. Are you willing? Are you okay with that? Look at me. Trust in me. Cling to me. But at the end of the day, that's all that matters. In this short five-minute life, where we will spend, each and every one of us, eternity, heaven or hell, right? Two things as we close. Two points. First of all, it's on the screen. Understand, as we come to the conclusion of this story and consider the whole thing in its entirety, firstly, delays, all delays, are determined by the Lord. You're a child of God. He loves you. He's demonstrated that love for you. He's given you the gift of salvation. What good thing will he now hold back from you? If God is for us, who can be against us? Right, Paul said. So all delays might be difficult, might be frustrating, might get hard, but all delays are determined by the Lord for his glory. Not for your personal enjoyment, but for his glory. And at the end of the day, that has got to be worth it. And, and as difficult as it may be, this is the mind of maturity that we're trying to put on and praying to practice as believers. The questions that come, it's hard. And it's why we got to talk about this stuff, I think, with mature brothers and sisters and say, man, this is what I'm hearing. Where are you, Lord? Why didn't you come? And why didn't you do the thing that I think you should have done? And, and all those questions and those whispers that people say and that Satan sends our way, little lies like fiery darts. Help one another out. Share these things. Roll away the stone, and it's stinky what's going to come out, but let the Lord deal with it. Confess your trespasses to one another that you may be healed. That's important. Share what's going on in your life. Bring it to light. Let the Lord address it, deal with it, heal it. Right? Questions that come. Despair and remorse and great grief. Lean on a brother if you're a brother. Look to a sister if you're a sister. Right? And tend to one another as the body of Christ. Delays are difficult, but they are determined by the Lord for his glory. And I'll tell you this. You have an answer to your question. You do. You have an answer 
for your question. It just might take time. You may see it here or you may see it there. And God's honest about that. Because there's something of greater worth going on. Your soul's secure. Those in your lives may not be. So look to the Lord. Lean on the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Uh, Look to the body of Christ to support you and sustain you. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Yeah. Yeah. Secondly, thank you, my friend. Secondly, firstly, delays are determined by the Lord. Secondly, your solution, as much as we think, man, if the Lord just gave me this now, everything would be okay. I'd be happy and, whew, you know, and so on and so forth. Your solution isn't something, right? It's someone. And isn't the Lord, over the course of our Christian lives, just, it seems, just always hitting that one and always bringing us back, calling us to come? No, no, no. Be like Mary. Sit at my feet. And we're like, no, Lord, it's about this and it's about that. And do this for me and do that. And then we'll get there and then we'll be better and and all that stuff, right? It's never about something. It's about someone. What you need in the midst of your difficulty, if it's death, if it's just despair, is the someone, not the some thing. I am the resurrection and the life, Jesus said. And he said that to Martha privately. It was just for her. She came and he delivered, right? A miracle didn't come yet, and for some it, it won't this side of heaven. But those words from the Lord always will, the whispers of the Holy Spirit, as you sit late at night because you can't sleep and you have the Bible opened, and you're just desperate for the Lord to speak to you, and he does. And he gives you a promise that you can hold on to. That's how he reminds us, isn't it, that he's real. That's how our faith grows. That's how we experience that he does love me and not just, you know, those that I read about in the scripture. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. I'm what you're looking for. I'm the one you need. It's not something I can do for you. It's just me. Important words, amen? Amen.